<clears throat> well, I'd like uh, to share God's word with you tonight, yeah, you. and uh, tonight's going to be the conclusion of our message series called Move. You guys been moving? Yeah. I've been moving. I don't know about y'all, but I've been moving, right? I've been moving, and uh, we've been moving from rhetoric to reality. We've been, what we've been trying to do is trying to examine some of the stuff we read in the book that sounds good, but we ain't living it, right? And, and, and we got to start believing what it says. Y'all raise your hands a long time ago when I asked you if you believe God's word to be true. You said yes. I asked you if you believe that God split the Red Sea. You said yes. And so you believe the Bible, but, you, but do you believe that when it says that sin no longer has control over you? Like it sounds good, right? But the way we live our life, sinning like crazy. I'm not going to look at anybody right now. <laughs> so do you believe it? So that's the thing. We've got to get there. And, and so we started that, that, uh, that series. We're going to, you know, I guess we'll probably jump back into Luke. But every time I say that, it doesn't happen. So I think we'll probably jump back into Luke next week, but you never can tell. And uh, I see here tonight that the Holy Spirit is already here and at work and changing the way we plan on doing things tonight. And so thank God for that, right? Thank God for that. I don't want to go if God's not leading. And so I'll leave that door open for next week. I don't know, but I think, maybe, we'll be in uh, Luke. I want you to grab your Bible and I want you to open a copy of God's Word. Don't sit there and look at me right now. Grab a Bible. And open it to Romans chapter 8. And we're going we're gonna to start there, but I'm going to... Thanksgiving's coming, right? Yeah. I'm going to gorge you tonight with God's Word. I'm gonna, you're going to walk out of here with your belts busting. Okay? And so I need you to be ready to be moving around a little bit. And if I leave someone behind, please extend grace to me. But I'm going to try the best I can to include everybody, but open to Romans chapter 8. We're going to continue our message series, Move from Rhetoric to Reality. The first week we talked about that sin no longer has control over me and that I get to choose my addictions. No one's going to tell me what I'm going to be addicted to. I get to choose it, right? And the Bible says that, you're, that you, whatever you choose, someone say choose. choose. Whatever you choose to obey becomes your master. So your master doesn't choose to rule you. You choose to let that thing be your master. That's what God's word says. Okay? And then we jumped into uh, the next thing we talked about was that uh, we're supposed to be fishers of men. Yep. Right? right? That, that, that a, a true follower of Christ casts the net. Yeah. Se sets the net out there. Goes after some fish. He's not just sitting in the boat with Billy Bob with a lure waiting for some fish to bite. No, he attacks, right? He goes after the fish. He throws his net out there. Look, he says, I will make you a fisher of men. So here's the stinger. If you ain't fishing, maybe you ain't his. Because he said, I will do this, right? So, so who's the slacker here? If anyone was a slacker, would it be you or Jesus? You better point to yourself, right? Because he's, he's not going to say, I'll make you a fisher of men, and then somehow fail in that, right? We know that. So if you ain't fishing, maybe you ain't his. Um, but if you're his, you better start throwing your net out there. I challenge you all to, to find one person to cast your net out. And I hope that you share. Listen, you got a story, right? He said to share your faith. You don't need to share mine. That's my faith. Get your own stinking faith, man. I don't want to, you don't need to share my story. Share your story. You saved? Did it rip you out of hell? So tell someone about it, right? No theology needed. He was, he was spitting mud. He's spitting the dude's face. And he's, now he could see. I don't know. I was blind. Now I can see. Where's your theology? Is that Baptist theology? Is that Presbyterian theology? Charismatic? Cessationist? Calvinist? Arminian? What is it? I don't know. It's spit. That's what it is. So cast your net, right? So, yeah. There we go. A miracle can happen now. All right. So then last week we talked about this, that that God, at the moment of salvation, the moment you bent the knee to Jesus, His Holy Spirit came to rest in you, right? He's in you now. 
And so he says, I have given you everything you need to live a godly life. That means your past has been washed, your present has the Holy Spirit, and your future has a hope for eternity. So you got everything you need. Nothing should get in the way of living a godly life, right? Do you believe it, though? See, that's the thing. We don't, we don't all believe it. We read and go, hey, that sounds good. But we don't necessarily believe it. So tonight we're going to study another one. You ready? Yeah. Say, I'm ready to move. Amen. Romans eight seventeen says, and since we are his children, anyone happy about that? Yeah. I need some hollering up in this joint tonight. Yeah. All right, that's what I'm talking about. Soldiers of Christ. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. Now, hold on a second. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I had a, I had a, I had a, I had a I, it's not revelation. Like, it's not new revelation, but it was revelation to me. This week I had, it hit me like a ton of bricks. People ask me, like, after church, hey, you, you want to go out for dinner? Or, hey, you want to go get something to eat? Or, you know, all the time. People ask you that stuff all the time, right? And I'll say this. Man, I can't, I'm broke. Eh, that's a bad answer. Well, hold on a second here. It says, since we are his children and we are his heirs, in fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory, I ain't broke. That's right. Come on. right? I, I need to change the way I say things, right? Well, if you ask me to dinner tonight, I might say, well, Jolene, I just don't have the cash right now. But heaven forbid I ever say I'm broke. Because I am not. I am the, the king's son. And I'm the heir of his glory. I can't, I'm not broke. I'm rich. I'm rich. Paul said I own nothing, but I have everything. I have nothing, but I give others spiritual riches. I'm not broke, and you're not. If you're a, a blood-bought believer in Christ, you ain't broke. You're rich. You might just not have any cash right now. All right, so you guys excited that you're heir to, to God's glory? That's awesome news, right? You all like that? That's a benefit for being a Christian, right? Awesome. Co-heirs with Christ. Oh, boy. Well, hold on a second now. Don't get too excited. But, oh, boy. But, but if we are to share his glory, which you all wanted, you all hollering like a bunch of crazy people up in here, right? But, if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. So we got to put a, 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 just a definition of suffering up on, on, on the table, okay? Just so you know what we mean. Suffering is simple. It's to experience or be subjected to something bad or unpleasant. Right? Anyone go through that? Okay. Now, 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 you'll see as we go tonight, and we, we unpack this idea of suffering that you must have, must, must, that the Bible would add to that definition just this little caveat, that it is to experience or be subjected to something unpleasant or bad, but it's because you're doing something good for God. Amen. Right? See, there's a massive difference between suffering and consequence. If you're a knucklehead and you leave here and go get tore up and get behind the car and you end up in jail, don't call me and say you're suffering for the Lord. No, you're a moron. There's a big difference between consequences and suffering, okay? If, if you go treating your wife like crap and she starts talking to some dude, that's consequences. The Bible says to, we're supposed to live with our wives with understanding, right? You better treat your wife right. If you want to be married for 147 years like them, you better treat her right, right? <clears throat> so, listen, this truth of su about suffering is stressed often in Scripture, but it's always left out in the teaching of Scripture. And that's not going to happen here. Okay? Um, we're going to look most, 
We're going to be all over, but we're going to look, stress two books of the Bible, two short letters in Scripture tonight is where we're going to get the most of the content in the message tonight, and it's going to be from 2 Timothy and, uh, 2 Timothy and 1 Peter. In 2 Timothy, suffering is spoken of seven times, just in that little short letter from Paul to Timothy, seven times. But it pales in comparison to 1 Peter. In 1 Peter, suffering is spoke of 19 times. So just in those two short Bible, those short little letters from Peter and from Paul, 26 times suffering is spoke of. And let me just say this, if it's God's desire that we would be Christ-like, if we were to, to ring out all that God would have for us in this life, right? We're to be Christ-like. We die, he lives, right? That's the goal. If we're to be Christ-like, then we need to see, is, is Jesus a good role model for us? I mean, it talks about suffering. Did Jesus suffer the way we're supposed to suffer? Well, I want to do this. So let's go to uh, one of those books, First Peter, just real quick. I'm going to be all over, so you might not, you might not keep up with me, but I'm just going to read it. And, and you can write down the references and check them later, which you should because you're writing them all down in your notebook. Amen? Okay. Um, 1 Peter 3.18, it says this. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death but he was raised to life in the spirit. So you can see here, Christ definitely suffered, right? He, you all know the story about Jesus, about the guy who was perfect, but he got whipped and beaten and slapped and killed, right? You, you know that this is what happened to him, right? Okay, but, but why? Why was he going through a difficult, why was he experiencing or being subjected to a bad situation? Why? For our sins, it says. He died for us so we could be brought safely home to God. He suffered physical death, so he suffered, right? But why did he suffer? He suffered for you. He suffered for us. He was doing something good. Did Jesus, I mean, I've read the story about him, right? He, never, he was a good guy. He really was a nice guy, wasn't he? He fed people. He prayed for people. He loved people. He was a good man. He wasn't doing something wrong. He wasn't the knucklehead who went out and got drunk and got thrown in jail. No, he was actually doing good things for people, and because he was doing good, he suffered. And that's why the, the great apostle Paul, who says, hey, follow me as I follow Christ, he says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, he says this, I want to know Christ. Now, no, no, hold on a second here. You guys know the great apostle Paul, right? Yeah. Did he know Christ? Yeah. yeah, right? He's writing about him. He talked to him. Right? He, he's the authority. He's the guy we're listening to about who Jesus is. He describes him all throughout the New Testament, right? So did he know Christ? Yeah. Of course he did, but he said, I didn't even know him. I want to know him. So if he knows him and he says, I want to know him, what does he mean? I want to know him at a deeper level. Right? I know y'all, but I know my wife a lot more than I know you. Right? Yeah. So that's what he's saying here. I want to know Christ. And so that's the goal for us. You want to know Christ? Yeah. More than just know about him, about the dude who went to the cross. Don't you want to know him? Right? I want to know more of him, less of me, right? I want to know him. He says, I want to know him. And then he's going to tell us how he's going to do that. I want to know Christ and I want to experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. Don't you want that? Don't you want to experience the resurrecting, the resurrection power? You want to see dead things come to life. You don't want to just say you're a Christian. You want to live a new life that's different than it was before. I don't just want to wear a cross. I don't just want a Z88 sticker on my car. I want to have Jesus Christ living and breathing in me, right? That's what I want. That's what you all want, right? And he says it. I want that. How? He says, well, to experience this power that raised him from the dead, he says, I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death. Now, why would he say that? He's saying it because it's a prerequisite. 
If you want to live out that Holy Spirit empowered like Christ is in me, changing me and using me to do great things for his kingdom, like if you want that, you want that? Yeah. I want that. Okay, he, Paul said, I want that too. He says, I want to suffer with him so that one way or another I will experience this resurrection. The only, what he's saying here is that this, the, the only way to live an authentic Christian life, like not just by title or that you go to church, I mean a true blood-bought Christ follower, a disciple of Jesus, a transformed life, the only way you can do that is that suffering has to be part of that. It has to be. The only way, he says, to experience that true resurrection power is to suffer with him. So, let's examine suffering closely in these two books that I mentioned so we can get a proper perspective on suffering and then if we'll cooperate with the Holy Spirit who's gonna be working right now using his word, we want to realign our lives according to his word. Are you ready to submit yourself to his word? Amen. Okay, does he have your attention? Okay, so I'm going to give you seven realities concerning suffering. Please jot these things down, okay? Seven realities concerning suffering. Here's the first one. Suffering is a worthwhile experience. It's a worthwhile experience experience. Now don't be fooled, that doesn't mean it's pleasant. What I mean is something different. It's a worthwhile experience. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 8 says this, so never be ashamed to tell others about the Lord. And don't be ashamed of me either, even though I'm in prison for him. With the strength God gives you, be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the good news. So he's telling us, this is what you should do. Be ready to suffer for me. Be ready to suffer with me. And the question beckons, why? Why would I want to do that, right? Things are going good. I got a pretty wife. I got two and a half kids. I'm making a hundred grand. I got a nice house. And I, why, why, why are you calling me to suffer? Why? I'll tell you why. And he knows this. God knows that people would ask that. And so he answers it right here. Why? Well, verse 9. God saved us. That's why. <laughs> For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. That means different, set apart, and God's word says, be holy for I am holy. Like, be like God. He says, I saved you and I called you to this life. And this is the sting. This is the, this is the big one. He did this not because we deserved it. Awesome right? No one in this room, I don't care how good and nice you are, you don't deserve salvation. Heaven forbid we get what we deserve, right? I don't care how, some of you are nicer than others from experience, but heaven forbid you think that your niceness gets you anything except hell eternal. And to think Otherwise, is greater condemnation. Somehow you're idolizing yourself. And that needs to go. Roll down the window and throw it out. He says, he saved us and called us to a holy life, not because we deserved it, but because that was his plan from before the beginning of time, to show us his grace through Christ Jesus. And now he has made all of this plain to us by the appearing of Christ Jesus, our Savior. Here's some more benefit. Here's why. Why would we want to suffer with him? Because he broke the power of death. Someone say amen. amen. Come on now. This place is, I don't need to lead you like a little horsey. Come on now. He broke the power of death and, and illuminated the way of life and immortality. Right, Andy? Where's Andy? Where's Andy? Right? Where's Andy? Immortality. He wants to be a super. It's always, where's Andy? Listen, when he walks in that door, y'all, I stop what I'm doing and you look at him and you go, oh, there's Andy. Okay? I will not preach another word if you don't do that. You understand? You gotta do that. I'll give you the cue. <clears throat> so 
So he broke the power of death. That's good news, right? By the way, I'm going long tonight, so be ready. And illuminated the way, of, the way to life and immortality through the good news. And God chose me to be a preacher, like awesome privilege, an apostle and teacher of the good news. That's why I'm suffering here in prison. He calls you to that same suffering because of this, because he saved you. Just that alone, right? Come on. How would even like a wretched, drug-taking, drug-selling, porn-selling, porn-addicted, used car salesman and loves me and saves me? Why wouldn't I give my life completely to him? Where else would I go? Right? Come on. <clears throat> All that Jesus did on your behalf it justifies our willingness to suffer. See, when you think, when you stop, and I, and I hope that you do often, if you stop and think of all that he did, <laughs> some things never change, man. It's been like 13 years. Still can't find the guy. <clears throat> um, so the, seriously, okay, off the horizontal, let's get back vertical here for a second. So, so, so if you think, 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 seriously, we, we got to stop, we got to think. Think about all that, like I just shared a little bit about me, like a little, little microcosm of my testimony, but think of yours. Think of your testimony, of what he's done for you. When you stop and you ponder that, I think there has to be what I'll call a Romans 12, 1 moment where the Bible says that I plead with you to give your bodies as a living sacrifice after all he has done for you. Like you got to think, what is he, like, and when you think about all that he's done for you, it becomes easy to justify this new life of suffering. Like it's worth it. It's a worthwhile experience, right? Here's the second thing. It's a, a suffering is a serving experience. Remember, Jesus Christ suffered for us, right? We just read that. And, and Paul says, to follow me as I follow Christ. Well, did you know that Ephesians 3.1 says, I'm a prisoner for your benefit? Like he actually went to jail for their benefit, for the people. Do you know several letters that Paul wrote? He wrote from jail. That's just the life that he lived. He was willing to suffer prison so that people could hear the good news and be saved. He's like, I mean nothing. You put me in jail. I don't care. Whip me, beat me. I'm in jail for life. I don't care. If, you know what he said? That he was willing to, for, like he had tasted the goodness of God. This guy's saved, right? He says, I would be willing to be forever cursed, like thrown out of heaven. Take his name out of the Lamb's book of life. He was willing to do that if his people Israel would come to know Jesus. That's suffering. That's who he is. And that's not so that we can go, oh, Paul's awesome. That's who you're supposed to be. It's enough church of phoning it in and pretending and facade. It, this is who we're called to be. <clears throat> I want to read Philippians chapter 1. I told you I was all over the place here. I don't normally do it this bad, but I'm going to do it. Philippians uh, chapter 1. <clears throat> this is what Paul says. He says, I want you to know, verse 12, I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. Do you know what happened to him there? He goes on, he says, for everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I'm in chains because of, of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. Okay. I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that everything that's happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. Now we're talking about suffering being a serving experience, right? To know what he's talking about here, you go back to Acts chapter 16 where it talks about the Philippian church starting. Do you understand that, that he's saying all that happened here, it wasn't good. In that story in, in, in Acts 16, it says that he was preaching Jesus and the authorities came and grabbed him and beat him with a wooden rod publicly. And then they threw him in jail and put him in stocks in the inner prison. 
in the cave, in the inner room of the cave. That's suffering, right? Doing good, not hurting anybody, just trying to help. And he gets beaten and put in jail. But he says that everything that's happened here is to spread the good news. You know what happens? It's said that he, he led the jailer to Christ. He led the Roman jailer to Christ, and then he went to his house and led the whole family to Christ. Right? That's, that's what he's talking about here. It's an opportunity to serve people. Are you willing to suffer to serve other people? I don't know. <clears throat> Here's the third thing. Jot this down about suffering. It's an expected thing. It's an expected experience. What do I mean by that? We're going to take everything right out of Scripture. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. So then, since Christ suffered physical pain, we know that he did, it says, you must arm yourselves with the same attitude he had and be ready to suffer too. Right? It's, it's, it's an expected experience. Be ready for it. Like it's not something foreign. This should be the standard operating procedure of the Christ follower. Be ready to suffer. Now he goes on in verse 12 of chapter 4. And, and before I read this, you have to know that prior to what I'm about to read to you, um, Peter speaks of suffering 12 times to these people. So do we kind of know based on that that the people that Peter's writing to, they're going through some suffering, right? Right? They're going through some suffering. And so his way to minister to them is to let them know it's an expected thing. That's the best way to be ready for something, right? To just be ready, just know that it's coming, right? So he says here in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad for these trials. <laughs> this is what Paul said, right? He said, I want to be partners with Christ, right? And so look what it says here. Don't be surprised at these fiery trials as if something strange was happening to you. Instead, be glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering. It's an expected thing. It happens all the time. And last but not least, in this number three, 1 Peter 5, 9 says this. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering that you are. It's an expected experience. Don't think that suffering for the Lord is only uh, reserved for those in third world countries that don't have water and it's illegal to preach. Just because we've been given the grace to live in America, that doesn't mean that you're not supposed to suffer for the gospel because it's comfortable here. No, the, God's word is true. You're not true. I'm not true. Culture's not true. God's word is true. And you need to be ready to suffer for the gospel. And if there's anything accomplished tonight, I want you guys to start suffering for the gospel. That's true love. It's true love. <clears throat> suffering is not the exception. Suffering is is the rule and and the, and the goodness of god like god's presence and his goodness aren't predicated on whether you know everything's going smooth in your life or mine or that somehow all of my hedonistic desires are being catered to now thank god when good things happen, right? Every good and perfect gift comes from where? From above. Like if God has graced you with, with a little bit of money or a, or a nice house or things are going good, like that's awesome, be thankful. But that, it, it, it doesn't need to be happening for God to be good. That doesn't necessarily mean that God is with you because you're loaded. It doesn't necessarily mean that God is with you in a powerful way because you got a Mac Daddy house. That's, that's not, but let me tell you one way, you know that God is with you when you're suffering for the gospel. That's the true mark of a Christian, is that you're suffering for the gospel. We gotta get real here, man. We gotta get real. We're supposed to be suffering for the gospel. A real Christ follower should expect suffering. Now, I, wanna, I think the Bible steps it up even more. Yes, it's to be expected, but more so, it's required. Now, I'm, 
I'm only going back here because it's worthy of being repeated. It's where we started. He said, if you want to share in the inheritance that God would have for you, you know that you have a good inheritance? That he's preparing a place for you right now. No mind, no, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can imagine how good heaven's going to be. Like you guys have, no, you, it'll blow your brains out when you get there. Right? But, but here's the thing. It's coming. It's, it's absolutely coming. You're going to have an amazing, amazing thing. But if you want that, his word, this is where we got to move, Right? We gotta move from rhetoric to reality. His word says, you want that, you must suffer. There's, listen, I don't care how crafty or smart or how many, edu- how many letters are after your name, you can't get around God's ways. You can't circumvent the system. I don't care how smart you are. I don't, know how, I don't care how good of a marketing planner you are. It doesn't make any difference. God sets a plan and you cannot circumvent this thing. And he said, if you want the, the inheritance in heaven, you got to suffer. That's it. He said, you must also share in his suffering. And let me just tell you something. Suffering is not something that God applies to your life. It's something that you choose. You have to choose to suffer. That's why this ongoing plead from Paul and Peter to engage in suffering, because he's not just throwing it on your lap. you got to go after it. You have to go after the suffering. It's a requirement. Here's number five. And it just leads right into it. It's why we, I numbered them this way. But not only is it, is it um, expected, and not only is it uh, required, but it's an experience you shouldn't avoid. It's an experience you shouldn't run from. Or an experience that we're all guilty of, that we pray away. Every time something difficult comes into the life of the Christ follower, we are tr- we're rebuking it with every rebuker you can come up with, right? Every time, all the time. And that's just not, be- listen, you remember Jesus, it says that be- for the joy set before him, like he knew something good was going to come at the- as a result of the cross, but the cross sucked. I mean, come on, right? He said, it says that he, in- before the joy set before him, he endured the cross, Like he went through the suffering now because later it was going to be good. He says he endured the cross, right? In the garden, he didn't say, hey, dad, this is going to suck. I don't want to do it this way. Let's come up with another plan. No, he said, this is going to suck. I don't want to go through it. It's going to hurt. You're not going to look at me anymore, dad. You're going to turn away from me for a moment. I'm not, I'm going to be heartbroken. I don't want this, but your will be done. He didn't try to pray it away. He didn't call down a legion of of angels to come and smite the Roman soldiers and take them down off the cross. No, he stayed on the cross to accomplish the mission that God had him on. And that's for us. That's for us. That's why Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.3, to endure suffering along with me. In 2 Timothy 4.5, he says, don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. And then 1 Peter 4, 19. All right, here's the, this, is, this is perfect. He says, so, if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God. See, there's, remember earlier I said that suffering, the Bible would add a little caveat to the definition, like it's enduring something bad, but it's for doing something good. Remember I said that? Well, look what it says here. If you're enduring, if you're suffering in a manner that pleases God, okay? So if there's something that you're doing to serve people because you want to be obedient to the word of God, you, right, and you're, do, and you're going through a season of suffering, he says this, if you're going through that, keep on doing what's right. Keep on doing the thing that's causing you to suffer. That's a choice, right? That's what I was talking about. It's not something God applies to you. It's something you choose, So if you're doing something that's causing you to suffer, God says, keep on doing it. But then he says this, and trust your lives to the God. Then he throws a little resume filler in there, who, by the way, created you. So he kind of knows like what what should work for you and what shouldn't, right? He's like, yeah, I kind of know what I'm talking about here. Continue doing what's right. Continue suffering, but trust your lives to the God who created you, for he will never fail you. 
See, Matthew 6, says that your father already, he knows your needs. And if you'll seek first his kingdom, even if it includes suffering, all that you need will be added. Like it's not, that, that verse is not waived somehow be, because of this verse. They all work together. He says, listen, keep doing it. Even if you're suffering, if you're going through a hard time because you're serving me and people are coming to the Lord as a result, don't worry about it if you feel like, hey, if I, just, if I do this for you and I don't do that, I won't make enough money. To... No, he's like, no, no, do this for me and I'll take care of this. But if we never give him the opportunity to take care of this, how will we know that his word is true? And it just is rhetoric in your life. If you believe God will take care of all of your needs, if you seek first his kingdom, but you don't seek first his kingdom, he won't take care of all your needs. And you'll always be doubting. You gotta give him room to work, yo. You got to. And that's what he's saying here. Continue doing it. And he'll never fail you. He'll take care of you. Amen. All right, here's the next one. It's like, man, all this suffering, this is kind of rough, preacher. Like, I don't, I was coming for some good news here, man. You're killing me. Well, I just got to tell you that um, number six, this is the good news. This is when you can breathe. The suffering is a temporary experience. Everyone go. Y'all need a mint or something. No, I'm just kidding. It's a temporary experience, so like it's, it's an expected experience. You know, it's a required experience, right? You're not supposed to run away from it. You're not supposed to avoid it. Quit praying it away. Like, welcome it in. It's good. But even if you choose to join Jesus in suffering, to serve others, and to build his church, you need to know that it's not a 24-7, 365 thing. There, there are times in our life as an authentic follower of Christ when we're actually choosing to suffer where there's a bit of a reprieve and God just blesses like crazy. It's his way of, of, of just taking care of you. Right? Sometimes he throw. Anyone ever have God just throw him a bone? He's like, thank you, Lord. Right? Out of nowhere. Here it is, right? Like, wow, right? I didn't see that one coming. Y'all got the check in the mail. You know what I'm talking about, right? And, and, and so he does that. Listen, I want you to read this. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. He says, In his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. That's an amen spot right there. So you, you guys will, right? yeah, man. I've been trying to train you for years now. You're not listening. I'm going to start a new thing now. This is the, this, these, see these tables right here? This is the amen section. Right? If you ain't amen and in hallelujah, you better sit your fanny in a pew. With the, right? Pew, pews are for old people, right? But the young, crazy people sit up here and they do amens, right? I need to hear some amens up in here. I need to see some people that are excited, right? If you're an amen person, you come up right now if you want to. Come on, let's see somebody move. We're moving, right? Who's moving? Anybody moving? Nobody's moving? Come on, Bethany. You come up here and you move. Amen. That's right. That's what I'm talking about. That's the amen section from now on. Amen. 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 So he says, in his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. Amen. That's, there we go. Wow. Okay, listen. So after you have suffered a little while, that's temporary, right? He says, for a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you, and he will place you on a firm foundation, all power to him forever. Amen. Amen. Right? So what this, this I don't, I don't, listen, this is not the gospel, this is me, but I think, having read that, I think that speaks of the here and now. I think that there are seasons of the Christ follower's life where it's really rough and you're suffering, but then there's times where he just says, reprieve. 
And he puts you back on a firm foundation. It's kind of like, you know, you go out to the war and, you get, and you're fighting and fighting and fighting and you get beat up and you go back to the base and they, and they band-aid you up and they, they give you some medicine. And they say, now get, get back in there. And that's, I think, what he's talking about, right? So you can know it's not a always and forever kind of a thing. It's temporary. It's, it's, it's for seasons, right? But also, if you go back to Romans chapter 8 where we started, it says that you must suffer with him, right? But the next verse is encouraging. The next verse is encouraging. He says you must also share in his suffering Verse 18, yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. That there's a day that's coming where Jesus Christ will rip open the sky and return for those that are his and we will enter into his eternal rest where there's no more suffering. There's a day coming. Did you know there's a day coming? Are you ready for the day? How's your to-do list? He told you to go make disciples of all people. How you doing with that? See, I'm going to mention it early, uh, later. I'm, I mentioned it last week or the week before, I don't know. But he said that, Paul said that I've done this. I've, I've, I've taken the call and I've poured out my life. And I've ran, run the race with endurance. I've done this, and you guys know. He gave his life to spread the gospel. And he said, and so because of that, I'm looking forward to the crown of righteousness that God will give me on the day he does return, but that that crown's not just available to me. It's available to all who would look forward to his return. Are you looking forward to his return? If you haven't done what he said to do, you can't look forward to his return. If you had a boss, remember who I give the clipboard to? If you had a boss and he said, I'm going on vacation, I'll be gone for a week, this is what I need you to do. I'll be back Thursday. If you haven't done that, would you look forward to Thursday? Heck no. But if you've done it, come Jesus, come. I'm ready. Right? You got to do your to-do list. You don't do your to-do list to, to have him love you. No, say no. You don't have, you don't have to do a to-do list to have him save you. Say no. But if you want the crown of righteousness, you got a to-do list, yo, and you better do it. I'm, I'm looking forward to that day, but some days I don't. <clears throat> some days I miss the mark, and I just want to do much better. Haven't helped me for my lethargy sometimes and my complacency when it comes to the gospel. Here's the last thing. Suffering's a good experience. It's kind of weird because by definition, it's a bad experience, right? It's something that you're exposed to, you have to deal with that's a bad or undesirable, unpleasant experience, right? However, God's word says something a little bit different. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 4 Verse 12 through 16 says, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. In, in, listen to the wording. Listen carefully. Instead, be very glad. For these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so you will have the wonderful joy. Doesn't sound like suffering to me of seeing his glory when it's revealed to all the world. If you're insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you will be blessed. <laughs> Further on down in verse 16, it says that uh, it's a privilege to be called by his name. Like, these are good things, right? Blessed and glad and wonderful, but the definition is that it's an unpleasant experience. So, is God and his, this is when the, when the, when the people, the, the cynics come and go, see, uh, God's word is, 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 is contradicting itself. There's all kinds of contradictions in the Bible. It can't be trusted. Did you ever hear that guy? Yeah. Yeah. But I would just offer to you that, that, that suffering being good doesn't contradict its definition at all. 
I would say that the experience of suffering is unpleasant for sure, but the fruit produced through the experience is very good. See? So it does go together, doesn't it? It doesn't contradict at all. Paul is in prison. Bad experience, right? Jailer and his entire family get saved. Awesome! Right? Worth it. Jesus on the cross being whipped and beaten and slapped and spit and killed so that salvation can be made available to all of the human race. Awesome. The experience, though, awful. It's unpleasant. Suffering is unpleasant to go through, but the fruit is tremendous and worth it. So, uh, proclamation, I shared God's word with you explanation to the best of my ability to explain what these verses are telling us and teaching us, and now application. Who amongst us is truly suffering for the Lord? Well, I don't know. I don't know that I really am either. But to answer this correctly, let's look at these two people that actually did. Let's look at Peter and Paul. Let's look at Peter and Paul's life a little closely here. But remember, as we watch their lives unfold and what they say and what they do, right? Let us look at their suffering, but not forget that we have to kind of contextualize our life. Because we don't live in, 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 in this oppressive place that's controlled by the Roman Empire. We're not living in a land where, where we, you preach Jesus and someone comes and rips you out of the church and beats you with a wooden rod and shoves you in jail, right? right? We're living in America, and, and the culture here in America is way different, obviously, than first century Middle East or Asia Minor, where Paul was planting churches. It's a lot different. So the look of suffering would change, but the reality of suffering endures even to this day. And so both of these men... Peter and Paul, we're going to start with Peter, they explain to us the how of choosing to suffer. How do we choose to suffer? How do we go about choosing to suffer? Well, here's how. He says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 14. Now, before the 14th verse, he's preaching and teaching about Jesus and our salvation. And he comes here and he says, Peter says this, For our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me that I must soon leave this earthly life. So like, he understands that in his his body is not immortal. His body is going to die. That there's a day where he will draw his last breath and it's coming. And Bible scholars believe that it was soon after this that he died. Like he knew, he knew, like I'm coming to the end here, man. He says that my life is going to soon end. Watch what he says. So I will work hard to make sure you always remember these things after I am gone. He's talking legacy here. He's talking footprint. He's talking about making a difference. He's talking about I want the world to be different because I lived. I want the world to be different because I shared the good news with so many people. Listen, he says, I'm, as I'm getting closer to my death, I'm going to start to work harder and harder to make sure that there's a legacy, to make sure that the world is different because I shared the gospel with a ton of people. And we're living in a culture that teaches completely opposite. It says, we're, don't worry about Jesus, right? Work hard at your job. Make lots of money now so that when you turn 65, then you can be lazy, And the gospel is so different. God's word paints a totally different picture. He says, listen, he teaches us in the Bible, work hard. You should work hard. Provide for your family. If you don't provide, you're cursed. I get it. But he said, I want you to work hard now at spreading the good news. And as you get older, listen, folks that are getting, like I wake up with aches and pains now, right? You guys know? You guys get it, right? You're not like a little spring chicken anymore. You wake up and it's like, oh, you know, to get out. Of, like, I understand I'm going to die. I'm halfway through my life at least right now. I know it. Right? I don't know how much longer I have. But, but, but according to this, it's short and shortening every day. 
that, that, that eternity is racing upon me. And so from now until then, I need to work harder and harder to make a difference in this world, to work, he says, work hard to share the good news. Amen. That's how we choose to suffer. We work hard. That was Peter. How about Paul? 2 Timothy. Chapter 4. Verse 5. He says you should keep a clear mind in every situation. In other words, there's going to be things that are going to come to your life that are going to fight what I'm about to share with you. You know this? The culture that you live in is completely adverse to what I'm about to share with you. And so you need to keep a clear mind, man. Focus, grasshopper, right? Keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord, and here it is again, work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. Amen. And what is the ministry God has given us? The ministry of reconciliation. That God makes his plea not through this mouth only. Your mouth, your mouth, your mouth. If you're a Christ follower, that's your ministry. No more excuses. It's about time a preacher got up and told you with his finger in your face, no more stinking excuses. He said, fully carry out the ministry that he's given us. Work Heart, listen, how many people work full-time right here, right now? Raise your hand. How many hours a week do you work? 40 to 50 hours. How many hours? 40 to 60. How many hours? 42. 70. Okay, so this is where it gets a little bit real. You will work 70 hours a week. You will work 50 hours a week to accomplish the task that your boss gives you. So at the end of the week, he hands you a piece of paper worth of money. And God's word says to work hard at sharing the gospel. And the most you can give him is an hour to come here. Heaven help us all. You think this to-do list is hard for your boss? God said, you're going to be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. The seven billion people that all stand guilty before a holy and perfect God and outside of you opening your mouth, they will be rushed into an eternity of hell. Work hard. Work hard to share the good news. That's what it says. Listen, what do we talk about here? We're moving, right? I want you to move. I don't want you to... Say, hey, that sounds good. I want you to live it. So when Christ rips the sky open and he's handing out those crowns of righteousness, that Jolene gets one, right? I want you to get one, Ricky. If, I, if you don't get one on my watch, I'm a failure. I want you to get one, brother, and this is how you do it. He said, work hard at telling others and fully carry out the ministry that God has given you. No more fake church, man. No more fake church. I want you to give your life. To him. See, this is just, just, just I, me, I'm guilty. Help me. Forgive me. But, you know, I get up here and I yell and scream. And I, I, I probably study the Bible probably more than most. But I'm not doing this, man. So I'm, I, I could sit down right next to you, Ricky, and, and I preach to me. Like, I'm not, he's, there's, there's, it's so crystal clear, this this God that you say you, you love and worship and this word that you say is true, it's so clear that he says, I want you to give everything to me. Don't, don't work 50 and 60 hours a week to have stuff and then give me an hour or two. Keep it, man. Keep it. He says, I want it. We need a massive shift in the reality of our lives. Like, we should be working with the gospel for 60 hours a week and then go get a part-time job. And people will look at me like, some of you looking at me right now like, this guy is a madman. But isn't that what it says? I'm not making anything up. 
Paul said, give your bodies as a living sacrifice. That that's your, listen, your reasonable worship. Like that's, he's, God's saying, I'll settle for everything. I could ask for more, but I'll take everything. Compared to what I've done, I want you to give me everything. And we don't. What would a church be was filled with people who gave it all? Holy mackerel. God almighty help us. What would it be like if all of us moved from rhetoric to reality? So that's the how. This is how we choose to suffer. By working hard. But here's the why. And I will preface this why by saying God is so gracious to even give us a why. He doesn't need to. But Matthew chapter 13, verse 44 and 45 and 46 says this, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, see, that God, God has an amen section too. You see? In his excitement. See, there's people that are excited about finding, oh my God, I get this. I get Jesus. I, I'm a co-heir with Christ to the glory of God. I get, I, I get to be on his team. I get to be in his family. I was wretched and he ripped me out of hell and put me on a, in a safe place. I get this. Woo! I'm excited. Right? There's some people like that. You're excited. I don't know you, but I love you. Yeah, right? So he, he finds this, 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 this treasure, right? And is an exci- is an exci- in his, I'm excited. In his excitement, he hit it again. And listen, watch this. He sold everything he owned just to get enough money to buy that field. That's how good it was. He was willing to get rid of everything to have that. It goes on. Again, same story, different object. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. And when he discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything he had and bought the, and bought the pearl. See, there has to come a time in the authentic Christ follower's life that Jesus Christ and his church become paramount. It's got to be the number one thing. And it saddens me when I know myself and other preachers are begging people, begging people, please just give enough to keep the building open. Please come and help to do this. And please just come. Oh, I can't imagine what it does to God when he knows what he has done and we have to beg people to come and to worship and serve him. Am I willing to forego much that the world would offer that I might partner with Jesus in building his church? It's first century stuff. This is America. So what does it look like in America to suffer? It's way different than Paul way different than Peter. But how about this crazy pursuit and the effort that goes with it for material gain and money? Like, I'm not ripping you, bro. I don't even know. You might never come back because I'm doing this, but you work how many hours? 50 hours a week? That's a lot, bro, right? It's good. So, so we, we work and work and work and work to have some stuff. And, and listen, it's, 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 it's all meaningless. Right? And, 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 and money, like, <clears throat> it's, it's worthless. Like, it's no big deal to have a lot of money. Thank God when God blesses and you have some like that's awesome but we we shouldn't be putting in so much effort to try to gain material and money and 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 that which god would would freely give we must be freely willing to give it away to build this kingdom we have to be and 
in our comfort? Really? Our time? How about being committed to gathering? At least, like, at least once at least once a week that you are committed to coming and gathering with your church family to worship him. How about being committed to serving here in the local expression where God has placed you? How about being committed to studying God's word? Committed to praying? Committed to God's kingdom growing in me? And then of course, I wanted to use my life so through me, like that that is paramount to me, above and beyond all other things. Suffering means choosing, just like Peter and Paul did, to work hard to advance the kingdom and stripping off all of the distractions. So let me ask you a question. Don't answer me. How, how, many, how many hours a week or a day do you spend watching TV and on social media versus how many hours a day you spend in God's word? What's bigger, your cable bill or what you give in the offering plate? Do you know, I don't know all of your situations, but the average car payment in America is $459 a month. The average Christian in church gives $104 a month. That's a problem. That's a problem. How much time do you spend in your vocational endeavors versus serving in the local church and gathering in large and small groups? I'm just telling you to buy the field, man. I'm just saying for this church, it's time to buy the pearl of great value, to realize who he is and what he's done for you and stop playing games and go all in. There's no, there's no weakening that. There's no lessening that. There's no, there's no way around it. There, that's the call of God's word. You, you read this. And, and listen, if we're going to make this invisible God visible to our community, that's how you have to live. That's how you need to live. If you want to live this, if you want to move from rhetoric to reality to stop just saying, well, that sounds good, to living this thing out. If you want to live this, this Holy Spirit-empowered, Christ-led, what the Scripture says kind of a life, you got to buy the field. you got to buy the pearl. you got to realize that he is who he is, and, and he's, he's mandated you, if you've said yes, to give your life to him. Okay? So we're going to receive our offering now. So I'm going to ask the gentleman that I've asked to please come forward. They're going to grab these baskets. We're going to have an opportunity here in a moment to sing to our Jesus whom we love and cherish. Right? If you want to give in the basket, you can. There's boxes on the walls you can give. There's a little computer in the lobby up there by the TV. You can give electronically. You can do that. I just want to challenge you in the area of giving. First of all, don't pull out whatever you think you're supposed to pull out. We're going to pray about it. We're going to let God talk to us. And I would just ask you as your pastor to please heed the prompting of the Holy Spirit of God. And if he tells you to give something, give that. Give that. Okay? Let's pray. 
And I'm not going to be shy. I pr I'm praying right now that this church would buy the field. I've been pastoring this church now for eight years. We've yet to buy the field. We've been coming in. It's a good church. It's a great church. It's not a perfect church, but it's a good church. But a great church buys the field. It's people buy the field. And they go all in. So when it comes to coming and gathering and studying and praying and serving and giving, buy the field, man. Buy the field. Father, thank you for this message tonight. Thank you for the work that you've done in, in me. And I thank you for every person that's here right now hearing your word. Maybe there's some that are surrendering to the authority of your word. Maybe there's some that are not. I don't know. But I pray, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit would go and touch every single person in here. And you'd speak to them and let them know what it's like to buy the field. What does it mean to them to buy the field? What does it mean for, for them to buy the pearl? Let them know what, what you've done for them, Lord. Let them know what you've done. Let them know the love that you have for them. Let them know the love that you have for all those that are not here tonight. Give them a vision of what it would be like to have a church filled with those that don't yet know you, that come and hear this good news of your, of your son and, and the gospel that saves, and they would rush to the altar and embrace you as Lord and Savior, and we would celebrate with them. How awesome that would be. Give them a vision, Lord. Help them to cast their nets. Help them to live godly lives. Help them to choose righteousness rather than sin. Remind them often that your spirit lives in them. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Maybe even right now, Lord, there's somebody in this room that's never said yes to you. That's never, ever given their life over and said, Jesus, you know, I just want you to be my Lord and Savior. There's something about these Christians that even though they're not perfect and they disappoint me sometimes, there's just something about them. They have this joy that I've never had. They have this purpose that I don't have. And I'd like to be a Christian. God's Word is clear. If you just believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, bled and died for your sin, on the cross, if you believe that and tell God, I believe that and I want to receive that as my payment for, for, for my sin, you're saved. And if you want that, you just come on up here. If, I'm talking if you've never done it. I'm not talking about that you did it the last three weeks in a row and you need it again. I'm talking for real here. You come up and we're going to pray with you. 